Hi, everybody, and thanks for joining us for this Traveling School webinar about where we go. Um, we are just going to jump right on in and start off with the agenda, which is on the next slide. Um, quick run through. There's three of us uh, presenting tonight. We'll give our introductions in just a minute. Um, we are talking about where we travel as a school. So um, we will start with our South America semester because we do have openings this spring for South America. And then we will do Southern Africa. So it's slightly different than what that agenda shows, but we'll talk about both places and then we'll click into how, um, how to apply. And with that, um, I'll just keep talking. Um, if you can see me, my name's Anj, um, Anj Thomas. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the head of school. I've been with the traveling school for uh, about 10 years in this position. And prior to that, I was a teacher on both semesters. And um, I am here because I just love our mission. I love what we do. I love seeing students become passionate about learning. Um, and making connections between what they um, what they're talking about in class, what they're seeing, and then also with their communities. Um, it's pretty amazing that no two semesters will ever be the same, and that's all because of the human factor and these incredible people that we work with. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Nisa. Hello, my name is Nisa. I use she her pronouns. Um, and I am currently an intern for the traveling school and I also attended the South America semester in 2019. Um, and I'm here because I love a lot about the traveling school. Um, and yeah, I think being able to do a semester of um, experience, experiential learning is really incredible. Um, and I, it enhanced my, my education a lot um, and got me thinking a lot more critically about the world around me. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to be here. I'll close us out. My name's Chloe. I also use she, her pronouns. I am an alumni of the Southern Africa semester in 2015. And now I am the development manager with the traveling school. And I, I love TTS because it was such a game changer in my life as far as my confidence and my curiosity. And I love seeing the impact it has on our alumni. Great, so that mission that I spoke of, um, it's what drives us and why, I was thinking about it recently, I just feel like this mission to amplify student voices through transformative education to ignite positive change is so important right now because the world's fast paced and it's all about screens. It's about multitasking. And that means it's hard for people to find that spark, um, the spark that drives them to be the person that they want to be. And I think what we do at the traveling school is we slow it down. Um, we recognize that there's so much to learn about our surroundings and that we can be, as long as we stay open, uh, we can find just meaning um, in lots of different places. And we can also learn what we're capable of. Um, and I say we because what I am still capable of learning and growing um, in this role and then what teenagers are capable of. So our classes and critical in, um, inquiry are really important, but more so it's that confidence to speak up and to trust oneself and to make good decisions um, in the world. And we do that by just slowing down and listening to one another. And our mission is supported by our vision of strong, compassionate leaders to build an equitable and sustainable global community. And we do this by cultivating collaborative inclusive learning spaces that empower young people whose voices might otherwise be silenced on the basis of gender. And this is kind of, this is the community that's out there right now. This is our group in Namibia on one of the sand dunes. Um, we are an inclusive all girls school, uh, high school age. So generally that means ages 15 to 18, uh, sophomores to seniors primarily. And uh, like we said earlier, we spend fall semesters in Southern Africa and spring in South America. 
And we make our curriculum, it's experiential um, and place-based. That means also it's tech light. And we're learning about the places and the people than the cultures that we encounter. Being a school, we are also accredited by the Western Association of, College, of Schools and Colleges. Um, we're also members of these other three organizations, the National Association of Independent Schools, International Coalition of Girls Schools, and then the Semester School Network, the SSN. Okay, me again, just for a little bit longer. Um, no matter where we go, we hold these four core tenants um, for our students and for our communities that we build. Um, so it doesn't matter whether you're on the banks of the Zambezi or the banks of the Hatunyaku or anywhere in between there on our semesters. Um, while they are very similar, it's different because, uh, like I said earlier, it's just a snapshot in time with a different group of people. Every itinerary is slightly different, um, and we do those updates based on recommendations from the previous semesters, new connections that we might have, um, but also because of the weather, um, because of what happens on the semester, if we won't need to slow down or speed up something, and the academic questions um, that are involved in a semester. So while itineraries change both in the planning phase prior to a semester and during the semester based on what we know or what we find, the whether, like I said, new communities um, or alum in the area or risk management reasons, uh, we keep our eyes open to the big picture um, and remain flexible in the day to day. And then of course, the other piece that's different is the region. So Africa semesters are generally hotter South America semesters are cooler and involve more mountains and backpacking and things like that. Do either of you two have any quick nuggets about similarities or differences that you wanna highlight? I love what you said about the core of it's the same, but you never, the groups of people and your teachers and what you, what you find and who you meet along the way adds so much richness to each semester. Yeah. I second all of those things. Cool. Well, all right, let's jump in. South America upcoming uh, for this spring semester. And we we're putting this in your mind right now because we do have a few more spots left. South America semesters generally run Ecuador, Peru, and then into Bolivia. Um, some of the main framework of this semester is um, we are in Spanish speaking countries. So to move around a town, to be a student out on town time and interact, you're conversing in Spanish as are a lot of our interactions with um, guest speakers in museums in communities that we, uh, people in communities that we meet with. Uh, this semester is a bit more urban. Uh, so groups spend a little bit more time in towns, uh, more lodging in hostels and eating in various restaurants. Uh, the transportation on this is also more mixed than it is in South Africa or Southern Africa. And Chloe will tell you a little bit about Big Blue later on. Um, but the South America semester, mixture of private and public buses, perhaps a train, and then often there's one or two uh, flights during the semester. And as I mentioned earlier also, it's cooler temperatures. Um, and then students uh, get up to about 15,000 feet uh, during the semester on some various backpacking trips. And Nisa will walk us through some of those experiences. Yeah, okay, I'm super excited to be talking about this. Um, so um, we started in Ecuador with about a one or two week language intensive, um, which I think is just important to put out there that there was a big variety of um, Spanish skill among the people in my semester. Um, so it's it's definitely open and available um, for everyone, no matter what your Spanish level is. Um, and Ecuador is in my top three favorite places I've ever been. Um, it was beautiful. It was green. 
like on um, just kind of mentioned before the weather is really interesting because you're right on the equator um and so every single day it was the same um but the same as in the perfect temperature, mid seventies, you can wear a sweatshirt, you can wear shorts. It's great. Um, but my most memorable things that happened in Ecuador, um, the biggest one by far was a two week home stay we did in a little community called Aguilongo, which is right out of Otavalo, um, where we were stationed for about two weeks. Um, and it was just the most beautiful community ever. It's right on a hill, there were blooming flowers. Um, and I, I think the structure of the homestay experience has changed a little bit since I did it, but we were paired up and put in um, various homes in this one community. Um, and we got to hang out with our family and play games with the kids, and cook with the parents. Um, and it was really an incredible experience. Um, it, I think at its heart is like just cultural exchange. That's what it is. Um, and it was really incredible and really impactful. Um, and so still, when I think about my experience, that is the first thing that comes to mind. Um, and the other thing that I think of a lot um, is the backpacking and camping trips we did. Um, like we said, it's it's super mountainous, it's super green, and you're also at super high elevation, um, which is difficult and you get used to it, but it's just incredible. You can see on this picture on the right, it's like, it's foggy. It reminded me of Scotland because that's that's my only reference point um but it's Ecuador and yeah I just I'm dying to go back awesome yeah so big picture other things that happen on these recent itineraries in Ecuador um spending time on a, a local organic farm learning about the growing cycle for different crops how to harvest and rotate crops to maintain the soil viability. And while at that farm, students learn how to cook with the fruits and vegetables that are growing right there. Um, also, we go into the Ecuadorian Amazon and investigate the ecological, economical, and sociological impacts uh, surrounding the oil and gas drilling that happens in there. Uh, might also backpack up to the Kilatoa Lake, which is a high elevation crater lake uh, that, and on that one, you actually kind of do a hut to hut hike. And then we try to sneak in a little bit of uh, rafting on one of the rivers as well. And if we shift to the next slide, um, Nisa, I'll let you pipe back in, but I think that this is one of the mingas, right? That might happen uh, with families in Otavalo. Yeah, so we did a minga, which is a work day. Um, and this happens in this community a few times a year. Um, and everyone in that community is required to pitch in and work on whatever project is happening that year. Um, so when I was there, there were two projects happening. One of them was building a fence around the soccer field um, so that soccer balls would stop being lost. Um, and the second one was cleaning out the gutters on the side of the cobblestone road that went through the whole community um, to give water a place to run so it didn't flood the street. Um, and it was a really, you're working, it's hard work, but it was a really, really like joyful occasion. Everyone's out in the streets, people were playing music, there was food. Um, it was a really cool way of getting to know everyone else in the community. Um, and it felt like a huge team working together toward the shared goal. Very cool. Okay, Peru. Um, so we went to Peru second and just like Ecuador, it was beautiful and amazing. Um, things that stick out to me in Peru. So in all of the places we go, um, on most days we would have what's called town time. So that's a few hours each day um, where you get to go out on the town and explore with your friends. Um, and in Peru, I think about this specifically because me and my two really close friends, we got a little shared, well, we together bought one little um, photo album and we treat it like a sisterhood of the traveling photo album still and send it to each other. And it's filled with pictures of us from our semester and like cute little notes um so that's really sweet I forget which one of us has it though but um another memorable thing which I don't think I can ever forget 
is one of her backpacking trips beautiful um and through the mountains again um and we had guides who were leading us um you know leading where to go and we got to her campsite and our guides had set up this huge tent with a super long table um like what you would imagine a dinner feast to be set at and on the table were like two huge cakes fully made out of jello nothing else except jello in the mold of a cake um which is not something i knew existed and it was it felt like a magical experience eating a jello cake in the middle of the mountains in peru i love those stories um this is a picture of machu picchu one of the iconic moments in the semester and of peru and yes traveling school semesters do visit uh, sometimes hiking right into uh, Machu Picchu after a multi-day backpacking trip. During your time in Peru, you'll uh, start to get to know the history of the Inca and pre-Incan civilizations, visiting various ruins uh, from beginning in the northern part of the country all the way down into the Sacred Valley. And also, you're going to break up that time uh, going on a backpacking trip or two, studying the glaciology and traversing the Peruvian section of the Andes Mountains. And again, uh, we have this amazing relationship with this family. Chloe, if you flip forward one, um, this is uh, Puma, and he is a shaman and also um, a guide in the area. So Puma's in that blue shirt um, in the front and then his brother back there and they're actually laughing with one of my students from Wayne Bet way back when. So just speaking to this sense of community that we have around the globe and these friends that are um, our traveling school family and that know so much about each semester of students and just bring their communities, cultures, beliefs to life and show us how similar and yet different we can all be together. Bolivia, yay, another beautiful, beautiful place. Um, so Bolivia is awesome. And when I think of that, those few weeks that we were there, um, I think about the, the wrapping up of the semester. So it's filled with nostalgia and like bittersweetness. Um, but as you can see, beautiful in that left picture, um, still mountains, still hills. And we got to visit the salt flats, which is an incredible place to visit. And I, I'm not sure I'm capable of doing it justice by explaining it, but just imagine miles and miles of white salt that's reflective. Um, and that was an incredible time. We did a three day road trip through the salt flats. Um, there was a lot of dancing that we did. We did a lot of silent discos. Um, so everyone listening to their music, dancing um, alone, but together, which was really special. Um, and a big, big part of Bolivia is a flash mob that we put on. So um, one of the classes you take is a PE class. And at the end of the semester, everyone was in charge of leading their own PE class for the rest of the group. And my friend decided that her PE lesson would be to teach us all a flash mob. Um, so the last day of classes, we went out into the downtown area that we were in and we performed our flash mob three times um, to the song Magic, but the Pitch Perfect version. And I still know this dance. I've taught all my friends in college. Um, I love it. Um, so that was just, that was like best moment, I think of my life. Um, and other last thing that I think of when I think of Bolivia, um, we were staying in a super cool hostel with an upper room, um, like 360 window view of the whole city. And we decorated it and we threw ourselves a prom and we wore whatever clean clothes we had and we felt very fancy. And it was, it was just, it was really wonderful. Uh, the flash mob might be one of my favorite videos from traveling school <laughs> times together. So a <laughs> uh, pretty special moment there for, um, yeah, for that group that just lingers on and, um, and makes us smile at the traveling school. Yeah. Like Nisa said, Bolivia is where it all comes together for the South America semester. So they finish, uh, their classes, uh, potentially visiting mines, silver mines, um, and talking to that community as well, learning about that. 
and the natural resources. Um, but it's really where they also come together and do their final expedition. Uh, most semesters go uh, and do a, a mountaineering course um, in the um, in the Andes there in the Cordillera Blanca and attempt to summit a peak. But they realize it's really about the journey of learning how to use crampons, getting comfortable on the glacier on this icy hilly surface, um, working as a rope team and traveling together on the snow. So again, it's just willingness to try something new, stretching comfort zones and leaning into new things uh, because you know that you have the support of about 14 other peers and four amazing leaders there with you that you just have this incredible trust uh, together with. So yeah, that's South America. Okay, we'll just bop across the, and around the globe and head over to um, Southern Africa. Um, so this is where we spend, spend fall semesters, which is generally um, late August into early December. So we do try to line our semesters up with most school calendars there. Um, so Southern Africa, uh, one of the biggest differences is that English is spoken uh, throughout our itinerary. Um, so everybody that you meet, I shouldn't say everybody, but most people speak English and then you chat with them a little while longer and learn that they speak um, of anywhere from four to 10 other languages, which is pretty incredible. Um, this semester is a little bit hotter. Um, there are the large game um, of Southern Africa that we pay attention to with our outdoor excursions. And this itinerary and the countries are um, slightly more fluid. I would say generally Zambia, Botswana, Namibia, and South Africa are the main ones that we go to. Um, however, often we do zip into uh, Zimbabwe. And part of that is just for the logistics um, of flight paths and also because we feel quite confident being there. Um, so this is where our big blue truck, um, where that company is based. And so we do have good connections throughout there. So again, routes change and here's big blue. This is, this is the famous big blue. This is a road. This is a big overland truck or bus, depending on who you ask that really accompanies the Southern Africa semester and students through the whole journey. Um, you'll see those kind of, um, not cubbies, that's not the right word, but on the bottom, you know, all the gear and cooking gear and tents are all stored there. There's a lot of group cooking and tent living that happens in a in a semicircle around Big Blue. And as a Southern Africa student, I have such a nostalgia for being on Big Blue and having the windows down and listening to music with my class classmates. And Big Blue comes supported by a driver and cook that travels with the group as well. And like Anj says, the Southern Africa semester might change a little bit more, but I'll share a little bit about my itinerary. So we kicked off the semester in Zambia, and I remember really settling into our cohort and our classes together. A couple fond memories are visiting Victoria Falls or Mosio Tunya, which means the smoke that thunders. The irony of that is when my class visited Victoria Falls, the water was very, very low. And so you didn't get that iconic thundering and um, fog, but you did get to see down into where the, the water hits and also got to walk up on the top very far away from the edge. But that was pretty memorable. And then that second photo, uh, another favorite part was canoeing on the Zambezi River in Zambia and canoeing past hippos and elephants. That was that was pretty once in a lifetime. And yes, yeah, so, oh, go for it, Chloe. No, you go. <laughs> I was just I couldn't help myself, but this is um, <laughs> one of those semesters where there was a little bit more water on um, coming through Victoria Falls. So uh, just imagine a science class right here uh, looking at the layers of rock 
on this huge waterfall, um, learning about the ecosystem that is special to that area because of the amount of moisture um, right there. And then uh, spanning out and thinking about the history of the name of Victoria Falls and the name of Livingston, Zambia, and why those um, why those places are named the way they are. Um, I'll give you a hint: colonialism, uh, which gets um, we we investigate colonialism on both semesters, but that's a big piece right there. Yeah, Chloe, what were you going to say? I interrupted you. I was going to say the exact same thing. So you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and while you're out there, you're also having class. So this is a small little math class. Um, it's actually happening during one of the river trips on the Zambezi. So on this one, they hiked into the canyon, uh, set up their tents for the afternoon, went for a little swim. And then uh, as it got a little cooler, they sat down for a couple of classes and then the next day hit the river to go paddle. Next up on my, art my itinerary was to head to Botswana. This was where we really started. I started falling in love with science class because we got to go on game drives to observe these different animals that you see in documentaries and read about, but rarely get to see in real life where I grew up. Um, so seeing lions and elephants and different things like that. And then similar to Nisa, also have fond memories of visiting salt pans in Botswana and really feeling like you're on the moon being in that, that different landscape. Yeah, and here's, I mean, just how close you can get sometimes to the animals in safe settings. This is a, um, it's a campsite called Elephant Lands, and students generally do a multi-day observational uh, science project there where they're collecting data on elephant behavior and then presenting it to uh, their, uh, their fellow, their peers in science class. And this is kind of just where the kickoff begins to digging into the relationship between humans and wildlife and land and climate change um, using, yeah, safaris as one tool, um, meeting with local conservationists, um, potentially meeting with uh, people who have, you know, used to poach for a living and now are guarding animals um, out in the wild and things like that. So just getting all these different perspectives to think about what you're seeing. Next up is Namibia. Nisa, I think Namibia is my Ecuador. Like Namibia is to me as Ecuador is to you. Namibia has a real soft spot in my heart. I think partly because it's where our group really bonded and got close. Um, and there's so much complex history to dive into in Namibia and such a variety of landscapes. It was the first time I was cold during the whole semester. <laughs> um, and these are some favorite photos. One on the left of me on top of Dune 45, which is this massive sand dune. And then the second is paddling the Orange River with a group of amazing guides that um, had a lot of fun with us and taught us a lot and were just really invited us into, into their lives. Yeah, and the Orange River makes up the border between South Africa and Namibia. So it's kind of fun to bounce between those, uh, those two zones there. This is another group sitting on top of Dune 45, um, which, I mean, it's just, again, so iconic. Every night, the uh, breeze basically brushes the uh, footprints out of the sand. So each morning, people hike up there at sunrise, and it's as if the landscape's never been touched before. It's pretty amazing. Um like Chloe said, Namibia is complex. Um, it really does set the stage for learning about and understanding apartheid in South Africa, um, just because you can dive into different so different um, influences throughout the years. Um, and so Namibia was actually a German colony. So German is one of the national languages there. Um, it's also a coastal 
uh, country. And so while um, it seems like you should be able to travel down the whole coastline and enjoy that, it's actually pretty well protected um, and also um, disputed in a way because of the diamond industry that goes alongside the coast. And um, and then so you jump into genocide, you jump into history, you jump into shipwrecks, you jump into potential slavery uh, things that happen there too. So um, yeah, there's a lot, a lot that you go into there. Chloe, do you remember any of those moments about learning about some of those, um, some of that history? Oh yeah. Um, I think you'll have to correct me on, outside of Swakopmund, is there some, you know, some history about a genocide that happened in Namibia and that really came to life by like, visiting the site and learning about that that is contested if it even happened and watching documentaries about it and Mm -hmm. I think that was the first time in a history class that we I had really talked about genocide in a um, really concrete way and how that plays out in a country and is and isn't talked about. Yeah you're right Chloe it is in Swakamund and then also in Luteritz there's Mm -hmm. a um, there's more there too. This is just another picture of Big Blue and the camping setup that the fall semesters um, live with. And so, yeah, those are the cubbies. Uh, There's a couple open on the side of the truck that you can see. The kitchen setup and then this little, um, little colony of tents there, swarm of tents. You can tell it's a rainy day because they actually have their rain flies on. Um, And then back in the back, you can see a group of students probably doing plank or something. They are in PE and that's what it looks like. Maybe push-ups, who knows? Uh, But that is a component of both semesters is doing uh, pretty routine workouts. Um, So whether it's in the campgrounds uh, like this or running down through streets in South America, or a multi-day backpacking trip. Um, It can look a lot of different ways there. I didn't notice them there in the back. That makes me smile. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) Last but not least, South Africa. Uh, Some memorable moments here was our time in Cape Town, really learning about apartheid in a really tangible way. Um, One of the places we visited with history class was Robben Island, where Nelson Mandela and many others were imprisoned during apartheid. And this was a pretty emotional experience for our group and led to a lot of great conversations and um, readings and things like that. And then on a little bit of a lighter note, also enjoyed a backpacking trip in the Titsikama in South Africa. Nothing on the scale of the South America semester, but still fun to strap on our packs and be outside in the in the mountains. Yeah, and it's worth noting. So South America students travel with big backpacks. Um, as their main bag. And then on the South, the Southern Africa semesters, it's living out of duffel bags. And so those backpacking trips are either a hut supported system, or we rent backpacks along the way uh, for those outings in Southern Africa. Um, This is just a quick slide, just again, showing the ocean, you get down to the Cape of Good Hope, Um, and then also over onto the Eastern Cape. So um, in waves much more mellow than this, you might go surfing, you might go snorkeling, you might just enjoy a sunny day at the beach, but here um, they might be headed out to a penguin colony. And then other things happening in South Africa, Uh, We try to go to the African Leadership Academy in Johannesburg and spend some time with some teenagers from uh, from almost every country in Africa there. And so go to their classes. Um, They come to some of our classes and spend about a week just getting to know them. Uh, We also visit the Apartheid Museum outside of Johannesburg. Um, Read literature from Bessie Head, uh, Trevor Noah, Um, all these other great authors, and then potentially go 
into the Drakensberg for some mountains or um, most, I would say almost every semester ends in a small town with some of our dear friends who lead a rock climbing business. And Chloe, you want to tell us a little bit about, yeah, those culminating uh, experiences there? Yeah, so we worked with Rock and Rope and Alex and Gustav, and they were so welcoming. And it was fun because we felt like we already knew them and they felt like they already knew us because of their long relationship with the traveling school. But the culmination of my semester looked like finishing my English midterm in the morning and then headed out for a climb in the afternoon or working on my final honor science presentation and then rappelling down a waterfall. And so it was this beautiful combination of um, what the traveling school does so well, which is learning and then going out and seeing seeing the big wide world. I love it. Ah, um, I might put Nisa on the spot here to tell us a little bit about whiteboard life. Um, Yeah, um, whiteboard life is um, basically how you know what your schedule is for the day and the week. So as Chloe and I have just described, there's no typical day on the traveling school. Um, Classes look different every day. Your outings look different every day. Sometimes you're backpacking, sometimes you're rock climbing, sometimes you're canoeing. Um, It's all, it's all exciting um, and it's always new. So every morning we would go over the whiteboard schedule. And just like you see on this picture, it would have basically everything you're doing that day laid out from what time you're waking up um, to breakfast, lunch, classes, activities, um, all the way until study hall, which we would have at night and then lights out bedtime, suggestion time. Um, And yeah, so this is an example of what a typical day might look like. Um, But again, there's no such thing as a typical day. and even even where it lists statistics and history in these classes, that doesn't look like um, maybe how you're imagining it. So your history class could be um, a walk around the town or it could be going to a museum or it could be all sorts of things. Anything you can imagine plus more. Wow. It's so true. You might have a full class day on a Saturday and then be out and about um, on a raft trip on a Tuesday. So um, it's letting go of the idea of weekdays and weekends on the traveling school. Uh, This quote just wanted to share uh, from a parent a few years back. Our daughter not only kept up with rigorous academics and that merged seamlessly back into a highly competitive high school, She broadened her understanding of the world and takes a more thoughtful approach to analyzing information and ideas. And I share this quote just because I think it encapsulates this idea that we are a unique school, but we are a school and our classes are rigorous and meaningful and students take the ideas and the ability to think with them into their next step in life. It also, I just want to highlight that we do have students that go on to a variety of next steps um, from colleges and universities throughout the U.S. to international experiences and then onwards to running their own nonprofits, being CEOs, being doctors, nurses, engineers, um, all of these incredible paths in life, moms, uh, partners, everything uh, that you know, that we need in the world. Um, what else is in here? Does anybody else have anything on that next step? Did it, well, I guess I'll ask both of you, did it inform where you wanted to go to school or what you wanted to do after high school? Um, I, I've been reflecting on that a lot. I'm a senior in college and I'm studying anthropology and I can pinpoint the moment that I became really interested. I didn't know it was anthropology at the time, but upon reflection, it was. Um, We read an article in probably a history class um, called To Hell with Good Intentions, and it was exploring um, the implications of voluntourism, specifically Peace Corps and other organizations like that. And that was just not something, not a perspective I had thought about before. Um, And I remember like that was the moment that I, I think I began to look really critically at programs like that. Um, 
And now that's kind of what I'm doing my senior thesis on, which is really awesome. Ooh, Nisa, I want to read that. You got to share that when you're done. That's exciting. Reach back out in May and I'll have it. Okay. <laughs> I will. <laughs> I will. Yeah, I don't think the, the traveling school didn't um, steer me in like what institution I wanted to go through to for college, but it did really influence me knowing that I wanted to have global perspectives and experiences throughout the rest of my education. So searching for study abroad programs that fit with my traveling school ethic and taking classes that furthered the, the questions that were started for me on traveling school. I love that. Thank you, too. So hope that all of you listeners are ready to think about applying And let's just move through what that looks like. You've already found us, which is important. Step one, um, on the website, you'll you'll find plenty of buttons that say apply now. Click that. Um, There is a $25 fee. The application is, um, it's short enough. And I will say, I was just talking to an applicant today who said, I spent five weeks thinking about how to answer that short answer, that short essay question. So you might open it and think about what you want to say. Um, You don't have to. It can be, you can sit down in one go. Um, And then we want you to talk to your school uh, so that they recognize what you're thinking about doing. They can help you plan ahead. And then we can work with your school to make sure that your credits and your work at the traveling school do um, reflect back to your graduation path. And our goal is that the traveling school complements your high school experience and that you can stay on track to graduate as planned. Um, Another piece of the admissions process is to get two recommendations. So one recommendation is from a recent academic teacher, and the second one is from either a teacher, a coach, an employer, a mentor, or a close family friend. Um, so we're looking for an adult uh, recommend, an adult recommender there, and somebody that you're not related to. And then, depending on your family situation, if it's relevant for you, um, fill out the facts form. Uh, And this is for a needs-based scholarship. And the FACTS uh, is a company that we work with that gives us outside perspective to each financial situation. And then being that we are a small school, we also will talk to your family about that situation. Um, And you can learn more by visiting our Affording a Semester page on the website or just reach out to one of us. I think I'll skip over this. Oh yeah, perfect. This is how you reach us. Um, admissions at the traveling school, or excuse me, just admissions at traveling school. Um, and then Mary Reed is our admissions director. Um, that is her phone number. And she also is supported by Hain, um, who we will get her number up on one of these slides in a future presentation, but she might Hain might answer an email um, with Mary Reed. So thank you all for tuning in. We are going to turn off the recording as we answer the question uh, questions from our audience. All right, thank you so much.